Not sure where Director Moore is, but I'm sure she'll be here imminently. Director Britt Medwards is getting a little something to eat. I'd like to convene this work session of the Board of Education on Enrollment and Program Balancing. Deputy Superintendent Claire Hurts is our staff lead on this. So, Deputy Superintendent Hurts, would you like to introduce some of the invited guests this evening and get us going? Happy to do so. Thank you, Board Chair Carson, and the rest of the board for being here and the superintendent this evening. So, we have an abridged presentation tonight. Well, there's 29 slides on the um, website, we're going to go through 10 here. Um, to get the high points, and, to, and we'll certainly respond to any questions on this whole presentation that we shared in your packets earlier. Um, our team has grown and benefit, benefits from members who have experience in doing this work in other districts, starting with Russ Brown, our Chief of System Performance, and Sean Berg, uh, Chief of Schools, Craig Cuellar, Deputy Superintendent, Shanice Clark, Community Director of Community Engagement and um, Tyler Vick from Flow and Analytics. Welcome back. Okay. Um, and similar to the vision process, we're being intentional on in how we're designing this work. Um, so tonight we will review the enrollment program process, including <coughs> the post scope of work for the multi year process. That's what we're really going to focus on tonight. Getting feedback from the board and the scope of work. So as we're bringing that forward, you'll see there's some um, things posted around the wall. We'll have a process that we'll be going through with you. Um, so we'll ask you to do an activity to gather feedback from the scope of work at the end of um, our presentation and after responding to some questions. And so we'll go over the work plan for the process and community and the community engagement plan. Um, initial data on enrollment considerations for facility capacity and utilization. And we ask you to hold your questions so we can get through the presentation. We will have time for questions yes. at the end. Can I ask you just a basic thing? The, on the bottom of the page on some of these, it has a page number and then it says, but then there's, on the other side it says refer to packet page 55. What, what packet is that referred to? So you have a, a packet that had a memo attached with the page numbers go to page 60. So what we wanted to make sure of, while the slide may have only had one page of an item, the whole thing is in your packet. Thank you. Claire, I just want to let you, I need to leave in 10 tonight. Well, and we can appreciate that as we started staffing at 7 a.m. this morning. Oh. We'll just we'll say that. We'll follow you later. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. I will welcome anyone else. It's <laughs> like those, those audio books. Just put out 1.5. <laughs> That's right. We're ready to roll. Okay, so then going on, just to remind um, that we have started this uh, process a year ago. We've been collecting data. We've been working on uh, policy. Thanks to, to Director Moore. And we have been gathering perspectives from the community in the board as, as we go along. Um, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Chief. So uh, the work uh, to date and, and moving forward is grounded in uh, the foundation of our, our values, the values that emerge as part of the vision work. Uh, Key to that is you know, students are at the center of what we're doing. I believe all students have the, the ability to succeed and that uh, we're aiming to have positive impacts on students and everything that we, we take on. Uh, obviously, we have spent a great deal of time talking about racial equity and social justice and believe in the fundamental right in, uh, to human dignity and generating an equitable world requires an educational system that intentionally disrupts uh, and builds leaders to disrupt uh, systems of oppression. We also uh, focus on honesty and integrity, and, and I think this is really critical in, in the work around boundary processes. Uh, I believe in demonstrating honesty and integrity, and, and it's, I think, uh, very much evident in uh, transparency in this work and providing transparency throughout the process, uh, both to the board and to the community and the people who, who participate in it as we move forward. 
And then finally, creativity and innovation. We believe in the power of effective problem solving, supported by a culture of creativity and innovation, challenging assumptions, nurturing curiosity, and welcoming new ideas. This is a process that is deeply embedded in the community, and, and we do not presuppose that we have all the solutions, but instead that the solutions will emerge from the community and the people who are impacted by the decision-making process itself. There are three broad goals uh, that define the scope of work for this process. One is uh, to support middle school redesign. With the opening of Kellogg, we have an opportunity to rethink uh, and redesign how we're going to provide uh, a middle school educational program for our students. Uh, and we can look at, at the schools in that region around that, how that will, will That's usually me. <laughs> Um, we're also going to be looking at optimizing the use of facilities. Uh, one of the key components of, of any enrollment balancing is making optimal use of uh, facilities and wherever possible um, you know, eliminating portable classrooms uh, as well in that process. And finally, um, again, in the process of um, revisiting how we utilize space and how we locate programs, gives us an opportunity to reduce the number of co-educator programs in, in the uh, portfolio as well. So as we move through this, you know, we've sort of talked about the, the, the underlying foundation for the work and, and what we plan on doing. The how uh, is in the next slide. And as I mentioned, um, I think first and foremost, this process that's being proposed involves deep engagement with community. It's where the, the people who are most likely to be impacted by this are represented and have an opportunity to, to uh, voice and test solutions in the process and ultimately uh, determine a proposed solution coming to, to the board, uh, superintendent of the board. It is a process that's grounded in continuous improvement. So it's an iterative process. Uh, it's one that, that is improved over time through that community engagement. It requires a focus. Um, in order to, to do this and do this work well, one has to focus, one has to narrow and, and have a very intentional scope as you're working through it to be able to get it done. Um, and that means also to support that community different driven process, there also has to be focus in geography. Uh, because the decisions again have to be made locally, they have to be made close. Uh, where they work. I probably would have started with this this uh, bullet my, if it were up to me. <laughs> Uh, obviously, it's data informed. It's a data informed process. Uh, you'll see a little bit of that here, but it's an iteratively um, data informed process. So as we work through this, as we we iterate solutions, you're going to see data informing that process as we go out. And again, our underlying values, the values that, that were uh, generated by the community and the vision and process, act as the foundation for this work, the guiding principles for this work, and help carry us through. This is a uh, broad timeline that starts with where we are and outlines uh, broadly some of the phases of the, the community engagement and the process that we anticipate to engage in in this year. So, uh, so your packets you can refer to uh, a few pages of, of this particular overview. Uh, but uh, we've got a few uh, arms of leadership with communications, um, engagement, and flow analytics uh, really driving uh, this execution of the community engagement plan. And uh, just some of the some of the overarching goals or things that we are, are trying to do is really get input uh, from from folks uh, in the areas close to them to inform uh, our decision making along the way and along the process, making sure folks understand uh, how they might be impacted, how they can be involved, and, and how uh, both the work groups and public spaces can connect uh, to issues or things that are showing up for them. And so we're really wanting to also encourage uh, the involvement or representation of folks uh, in these work groups uh, to also be those people who are ultimately impacted or potentially impacted uh, by the changes, but also uh, having just uh, responsible representation of our uh, historically underserved communities and uh, making that link between uh, decision making uh, in our district, uh, having access for different at different levels uh, for different uh, 
types of folks uh, that we serve uh, in our district. And so rebuilding trust through that consistent, authentic, uh, transparent work within the work groups uh, throughout the process as, as an overarching theme. And I really see the uh, community engagement process from February to November being maybe the first heavy chunk that we'll take after uh, maybe making sense of the scope of work in its finalized state. And I see uh, the next iteration of our planning with the engagement process really blossoming uh, after uh, we're kind of set uh, in, in consensus. Uh, but I do see uh, the resource of these work groups, everyone in it, including staff, uh, in addition to our parents, our families, community organizations, uh, to be uh, resources to the community. And uh, we're using insight and their experiences, but also uh, enrollment data and policy and uh, really uh, informed, uh, I think, perspectives of how spaces and facilities uh, are being used. And, and so they'll have an opportunity to unpack those things uh, throughout the work. Uh, and ultimately, some of the tactics that we'll, we'll be using uh, are meeting community where we are and using uh, methods like uh, websites, booths, events, uh, open houses, uh, and different uh, ways to be ultimately responsive. We're uh, working with folks upon request for different things like briefings. And so uh, those are some overarching pillars, if you will, of what we're thinking of working through and there is a very deep, extensive, uh, I think, outline of how we might build uh, this timeline <coughs> backwards to do this work. Uh, ultimately, we are going to fine tune that with the scope of work. Uh, and our work groups, uh, I mentioned there's community uh, and families, uh, but we are wanting to engage principals and staff and have a healthy representation of folks across the district. Uh, in addition to uh, making sure there's space for, for student and family voice. And so I see this as one iteration of uh, what's to come, and uh, I think we'll, we'll hear more about how that will look. Uh, Hi, so um, as you all know, we've been uh, analyzing data for quite some time now, and we continue that both for um, mm -hmm. modeling purposes so that we can adequately Good options, and uh, as Russ mentioned, work through the process along the way. Um, there's additional slides in your packet, um, and just for, for purposes of, um, of time, I'm just going to go over a couple of those. Kind of point some of the key variable data variables that we're looking at that are, that are drivers um, for us for this process. So the first slide here that you're looking at is essentially uh, by high school cluster showing five grade configuration enrollment current and forecast enrollment uh, per uh, Portland State University's Population Research Center. So for example, Franklin. I'm, I'm sorry, can you yeah. get, go to a new slide? Can you tell us what slide it is? Because we have um, the all the slides. Uh, it is slide. It's number 22. It's a district overview, yeah. The first, uh, first day of the slide. Thank you. Okay. So again, high school clusters, this is simply showing grade configuration enrollment, uh, current enrollment for 2019, and enrollment 2023 is as forecasted by Portland State University's Population Research Center. Um, so for example, Franklin High School, uh, 9, 9 through 12, showing a, a change from 2019 to 2023, about a positive 154 um, to the change. The next slide um, point out is grade reconfiguration. Um, provides an overview of grade uh, configuration across the district with a darker color in the map there by high school cluster, um, showing high school clusters that have a higher number of K schools. So if you notice the entire district at the configuration level, you can see the uh, proliferation of Ks in southeast. And in fact, we you know there are seven Ks in southeast, um, six alone in the Franklin cut cluster, and one additional one with Harrington Park and the Madison Cluster. And then the last one I'm just going to briefly talk to is the, uh, you're going to want to, it's actually the next slide. Uh, fast forward two slides to the grade configuration, southeast focused. So when you zoom into the, the region, the district most densely served by, by options, this slide shows the location number of programs in Southeast. 
um, including access and location of language immersion programs that in some cases are right next to one another. Um, and so the, the data behind this is that at an overarching level, Sean's going to share with us here, your brief as well. So if you go to I think slide 29 in your packet. So uh, we're focusing tonight on the Kellogg uh, that school being built. We also want to provide you the data for every school in the district. So I just want to go over this chart, just to do an example for you. So if you look uh, about halfway down the page, you see Bridger. Is that online? Is in that area? Yes. And so the first column on all these is the functional capacity. So that's the um, basically the capacity that's currently uh, in the school. Um, and then you have next to it the enrollment. So at Bridger, the capacity is 510. The current enrollment is 516. And um, then you go across and you see the projected enrollment for 23, 24. That's based on uh, dem demographic projections. And um, then the capture rate is the percentage of students that uh, live in that catchment area that attend that school. So for every school in the district, you have that. The next column is the historically, uh, it's combined historically underserved populations of the group. And then the next two columns are what show you uh, the utilization. So Bridger currently is at 101% occupancy because it's just slightly over enrolled. And it's scheduled uh, in 23-24 to be also at 101% utilization. The next two columns <coughs> show the uh, number of modular classrooms. So on this campus it's six. And the average age of those is 22. As you look through this document, you'll see some campuses have an average age of 80, 72 years old for modular yeah. campuses. So you'll see uh, that is an interesting. So does that mean that the portables are 80 years old? The average yeah. age. So they're right before. That's why you don't call them portables. Modular campus. So they range in age from you know a low of you know. Uh, 20 years is pretty young. Uh, you have some 60 year averages, 80 year averages. So you'll see them here um, throughout, throughout the document. But are the modulars included in the functional capacity number? They are right, right now, now because yeah. they're using them. Yeah. Yes, they are. Yeah. And then the other thing that not all of these, the reason I chose Bridgers is that it's kind of, it has a little bit of everything. So you'll see that Bridger has one co located program there. They also have, you know, they were a K school. And they also have the distinction of having less than 50 students per grade in K through five. So that obviously has staffing implications that you don't necessarily have um, two grades that are, or, or we're overstaffing the building to give them two teachers every grade level, even though they wouldn't necessarily qualify for that by formula, but you can't have you know, classrooms based on our collective bargaining agreement. And the school also has a single strand uh, neighborhood program. So you'll see this in your documents on page 56 to 60 that of the board memo that you have, but you'll have this for every single school. Um, so, and again, we're focusing right now on the Kellogg area just because that's the first area of study. What am I missing in the numbers here with the, with the projected enrollment dropping to 432 with the utilization sustaining at 31 percent? I think the utilization's on 2019 only. That does include the, the forecasted numbers on that. Yeah. So the, the port, so we've got the, the 1920 school utilization and the 2023 forecast school utilization. It ju I get it, 516 out of 510 is 100%. It just seems like if it drops to 432, the utilization needs to come down to. Yeah. 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 <coughs> Okay, at this point, um, we did pass off quite a bit of material, and I just want to open up for clarifying questions from the board. And then we'll be going through um, a feedback activity, especially surround, uh, around the scope of work, as well, that's something that we're bringing forward um, for the board uh, to review and um, give you know, feedback on our multi-year process. So at this point, I just want to open it up to questions. This is a really random question. I, I read this article, and I don't think it was um, necessarily very credible with my little techniques. But it, it talked about how there was a, a decline in births during the Great Recession that's impacting public schools now. Is that a, is that a true thing that's happening? Is sort of, you sort of have like a, what, a four or five year gift that's moving yeah, through? Post, post recession, birth rates. Um, went up, and so what we saw is that blip in student enrollment working its way through through the system. And so when it was working its way through middle school, for example, we were working up in Tacoma through their boundaries, and they were 
we're just waiting for it to pass, and now we're saying it work its way through high school mm -hmm. here in here public schools. Interesting. Okay. There was also, I think, a change in patterns of uh, people living in Portland having kids and then going, okay, let's, let's get serious. And the affordable housing at the time was Aloha or somewhere outside of the district. Woodburn. And that, uh, that switched and all of a sudden we had, I mean, that was a piece of the gentrification where housing was affordable and she's not so bad living in the city after all it happened. So the, the outflow of kind of pre-K families with pre-K kids changed. And maybe another sort of global question, maybe as we're beginning, but when you know, going back to slide 22, and I'm sorry, I haven't spent a whole lot of time with this data, um, but it does look like K through five generally is flat or, or dry. 2023 forecast. So that's, that's that is something we're consistent that's true. throughout the district. That's very contrary to what the public thinks is happening. Well, that's true. a lot of our population growth is due to adult in migration, not Oregon has the lowest birth rate in I don't know how long. I mean, we've had a very low birth rate for the last five years. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since the school clinics came in, says Director Bruman Burns. <laughs> but we so here we are on both the supply and the demand side again. Right. But I think we do. I think most of the migration that we're seeing is single people, uh, young adults moving. Um, there are some older folks, but we aren't seeing this growth in families. And I think of the people who are moving here, as we look at the increased cost of housing, um, and I think we know millennials are delaying having families, so we're seeing this decline, I think, across the country in birth rate, but it's definitely, there's a high impact here in Oregon based on the demographics of who's moving here and the cost of living. Question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, it's around the post of the work. And um, I'm looking at this as like very facilities related, and I'm wondering like why most of the work wasn't like optimized um, student learning. And then sort of a corollary question is on all like, lots of data, but um, there's no student achievement data, and I think just my experience in Portland is where you have under-enrolled schools, there's usually um, uh, just the test data is not as strong as in other places, and that if we don't um, I think consider that as part of the process of how families are making decisions, it, we can do a lot of moving around, and it's, it's an important piece of data for us to know, like, why are the capture rates in this quadrant so low? It's like, is it because there's a sense that people want to get out of their neighborhood schools because they don't feel like they're, I'm not saying this is true, but they, they feel like they're not going to get, there's a perception they might not get, their students might not get the same quality of education as the students, as a school that very high levels of achievement. So how does that inter, interplay? Um, is, it, is it real or is it perception? Um, I mean, given that a lot of those schools are in the outer southeast and the neighborhoods, it just, it seems like we have concentration, so if we don't address that, that's different. And, um, I guess a larger question I would have as well is just the title of the exercise. Because um, I thought it was about equitable programming and enrollment balancing, not just an enrollment balancing exercise. Because um, I think it speaks to like, what are we trying to accomplish um, versus just making sure that we have the same, you know, the right number of students in the right schools. Because that's the, it's important. But it's not the same as the um, process that also creates equitable, more equitable. I know this isn't this. It's like a building, it's a building conversation about facilities rather the, the, the people side, which I, I also thought would, were kind of going hand in hand tonight. So one, one of the things, um, at this point we're looking for questions, and then we're going to go more into a feedback. Activity. So I guess my question is like, why did why didn't we do that? If I was going to phrase it as a question, like, why isn't it more 
connected to what's happening in the school in terms of learning, because I think that is actually part of the factors of us driving sort of parent decision making and you know choices that happen within the district. Okay. So why, why, don't, why don't we have that data? And why why isn't that part of one of our goals? So tonight's um, presentation was a preliminary data source. It wasn't intended to be an end all. Um, uh, we're going to see mountains of data in this process. So what we were trying to do was give you a high level overview of what we have coming. And then um, in, when you look on, in, if you're in the packet, you have this proposed scope of work, 30 pages 30 to 32. And that's where we actually talk about um, data informed and RESJ lens, racial equity and social justice lens to inform decision making. So that's absolutely part of the work. And it's embedded in our approach and sequence of work in the scope of work. So that's the part that we're going to be working on input from you guys. So that will be a perfect opportunity for you as we get to the next step in um, the feedback um, activity for uh, that to really draw that and highlight that. I think I was happy to see that one of our explicitly stated goals was to reduce co-location, which is driven by um, what we know it means for school climate and student achievement. Um, and before, I think we've kind of talked about it as a, it would be a, it would be a um, fortunate coincidence or, you know, um, a consequence of this work, but now to see it as an explicit goal, I think is good. Well, I, I would also add that the first goal um, is explicit about the redesign of those school program. Yeah. And, and so, uh, Kellogg again affords us an opportunity to redesign and think about equitable programming across middle schools and I, I think it is woven within that, and certainly um, it would not be unusual to see additional data to inform that process. It's just not stated, and I think when it's not stated, it's like, like how do we draw the boundaries of Kellogg? It seems like a more antiseptic exercise than. Okay. Yeah, when we get to the next step, we're going to get, capture all that uh, feedback, but I hear what's coming and you're kind of giving, giving us a precursor. I want to make sure, is there any clarifying questions now um, from the board on the, the materials that you've received? And then we'll move on to an actually a dialogue and activity of, of capturing your input. I, I do have a question about sure. our catchment data because I've always been suspicious of that because I have numbers I've seen in schools and neighborhoods I'm familiar with just didn't, didn't add up. Well, how do we gather that? Capture. Capture rate? What did I say? Catchment. Oh, jobs. Uh, how, what percentage of kids in the catchment area are we capturing? So capture rate data is, mm -hmm. is um, along with a lot of the, the enrollment data that you're saying on the, the, the um, summary report is included in and held within the certification system. And so as we work with, with the district's data team and all the team to get that data and then QA to make sure what we're saying in our models and data sets match with how the district reports it. Um, so all that goes through a really but careful QA process. Is it just relative to uh, kids that are in our system that might that are attending another PPS school outside of their neighborhood catchment and it doesn't reflect kids that aren't attending public school that live in that area? Okay. That, I, I was curious about how granular, like it sounded like it was household level data, but it's really just kids that are already in our system. Yeah. Kids are in the system, yes, that are that registered. Are re registered, have address associated with them that we can we can look at down to you know, the parks on which they live. But yes, they're in the system, so they're in. Okay. They're in the PPS system. Yeah. So I have a question on the reduction of co-located programs, and just like generally how you do that, because I look at that swap between. Powell to Burnside, the river to 82nd, and it appears that there's only two two schools that aren't don't have co-located. So there's like 20 schools, all have so this huge swap running from the river to 82nd. So what does that mean by reducing the number of co-locations in neighborhood schools into focus schools, or are we are you envisioning? Closing um, co-located programs or consolidating them, or because I'm just wondering, like, 
there's 20 co-located program books, 18 so, um, in this swap. I can see on the west side there's like one or two, but there's, so what, what does that mean? So the, we were very careful to choose the word minimize. That doesn't mean that there won't be any. But what we know is that it ca causes some imbalance in our schools when we have co-located co programs because the um, number of classrooms at each grade, each grade level goes, goes down um, and then you have big swings in our class sizes, right? And you could have the same grade level having very um, different class sizes in the same uh, physical school but in two programs. So, in order to do that, um, there are many methods, and we're not suggesting just one method, but as we look at the um, region on a, in a whole um, basis, we consider these are the things that we're hoping to accomplish. Um, so, for instance, if we have two Spanish um, dual language schools that are co-located that are right close proximity, we might consider making one of those a neighborhood school and one of those a dual language for Spanish school. So that then you have um, more classes at each grade level at each school, and which then creates more balance in, in our system. So that's an example. But there, there are, um, it's not intended to um, just look for one solution, but, but bringing a community group together and principals together to find the best solutions for that region. And are there other comments from others that have done this work? <coughs> so another follow-up question is maybe yeah. answered, but if that's the type of how we might minimize. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if we've done a case study of the out of the implications for. Or what happens when we did that with Riddler and Scott? Because um, that's exactly what we did. Except for, we, left, we didn't entirely end co-locating, we still have the co-locating, but we have a co-working school, isn't that right? Yeah, it yeah. Does. And so I'm wondering, but we did eliminate a neighborhood school for one community, so I'm wondering, have we done any sort of analysis of, did that improve student outcomes, like family, um, Attention to families in those neighborhoods, or do they go to other focus options. Or is that something we've looked at since we've been doing this? Well, we know how regular is doing. Yeah, we had one cycle uh, here, um, and I would say there's a couple, there's a lot of different efforts going on to improve the opportunity that students in those neighborhoods have. Uh, and a common strategy for districts to have two school uh, zones of attendance. Especially when you have programmatic choices that you want to make a um, full school model. So it, it's a good question um, because um, there's probably a lot of case studies we could do, especially for some that might have been in place even a little longer, that, that could be uh, informative uh, to the work that we're trying to accomplish here. Because um, I think that's a good point. I mean, that's a move we've made and it feels better. Early signs are that. Or uh, some, some initial part of the learning outcomes. Um, and certainly, it can build a school culture around uh, a singular program that exists under the same roof. Um, so, you know, I'll always advocate for uh, uh, that kind of a model uh, as a preference. Um, so, So at this point, I'm, would, I'm thinking we should shift from questions to um, the feedback process. Okay, I just want to, I'm just seeing if there's any rush for a question. I'm not really seeing one. So, um, board, you each have um, some sticky notes next to you. And um, we have some dark ink pens. We're going to ask you not to use a flying tip all points because it's hard to type them up. So Judy's handing out some dark black ink pens for you guys to use. Um, so what we'd like you to do is group up in, in twos and have a conversation 
with your partner at, at your table. And look, um, specifically, I'm talking about the scope of work. So in pages 30 to 32 in your packet, we're looking for feedback on these three pages. Because this is the key to how we're designing the work. And we want to, we, yes. Carving up kind of question. Yes. Did you want us to be using like Sharpies like we've done in the past, or do you just want us to use like? As long as you have something that's dark ink and this is like a pencil. Well, or we got like it. black pens. So black pens. Okay. Same like okay. black pens we've got for us. Yes, that's fine. Right. Right. We just wanted to make sure that and that we don't have Sharpies tonight, so we're okay. The so black pens will be fine. So, but in order to do this exercise, we'll need to have the scope of work in front of you. And um, it is available online if you need it. <coughs> you will no notice that where Judy's standing back there, number one, that's the introduction there and then it goes around the room two three four and five so while you're talking to your partner you're going to look at what are the strengths about these the pieces of the scope of work we're doing for you and what are the outstanding questions is there some suggested improvements is there we just want your thoughts and your feedback on each of the five sections so it's broken out by introduction in the first, core values is number two, outcome goals is number three, and then approach and sequence is split in half, one through three on number four, and four and five on number five. So what we're gonna ask you to do is sort your stickies. Um, first, um, you're gonna create them as you're um, sharing your ideas as you go through this together in a pair, and then, um, we would, once we've asked you to go through and you've got all your ideas on stickies, then we want you to find your top two that are the most important to you. And then we'll ask you to share those two with the group. And so we'll go around to each board member. And then we're gonna ask you to post the stickies to all the five sheets. We also have, um, if it, something doesn't fit on one of those five sheets, we have that parking lot, the yellow, one over there, and so we'll just ask you to put that question statement, um, whatever you comment you have on the parking lot sheet. Yes. So two stickies for the whole process, or two stickies per area? You can have as many stickies mm -hmm. as you want. But when we're sharing one. out. But what you're sharing out is two stickies total. And then once we post them, then we'll all, then each of you will go around and read every, you know, see everyone's input. And then we'll come back to the table and we'll do a whip around so each one of you can summarize your learnings from the gallery walk. And you already said the same thing, but do each of these approach and sequence of work relate to one of the stickies on the wall? So um, the introduction is right here, Okay. is number one. Number one, okay, and then it The second one is core values. Okay. The third one is outcome goals. The fourth one is one through three for approach and sequence, and number five is four and five for approach and sequence. Okay. We're just making a big font, spreading it out so we can get everyone's ideas. Questions about the process? So we got that huge, I mean, a big, a big deck has a lot of other stuff in here. I mean, so like, for example, the timeline, which I had some like, questions about. So the parking lot is for anything that doesn't fit into the scope of work. Because we ha tonight we really want to focus on this getting the feedback on the scope of work, but we'll absolutely take any question or comment about any part of the packet on the parking lot sheet. Okay. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right, so go ahead and you're each sitting at a table of two if you would just start your conversations and write your cookies. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure. 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 I'm not
But I also did not say or comment on all these facilities and resources. Yeah, I like how the students are kind of refining our work. Okay, we're going to go here. We're good. We're doing great. We're doing very matching. We're very matching. So that sort of helps me. Best of friends. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Yeah, we got Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I just started. I should say, tactical work is primarily I'm 
Okay. It's not a causation. Well, I'm, uh, I'm a you guys give me a sense of how much more time you have for two minutes. I hear two minutes. Oh, yes, I agree. Seven minutes. Yeah, I can do it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Both and your AP, what's her name again? Erin? Alex. Alex, that's right. So it's the for I know we can go back and forth. Whatever you want. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Yeah, sure. Yeah, but I'm not wearing it. That's the stuff that we can share. It's just not that you can do it. It's just not that you can do it. It's just not that you can do it. <laughs> I just creepily put it on her back. I just 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 put it on her back. Okay, that's the five minute mark. So I want you guys to find your top two that you want to share with the group. So find your top two that you want to share with the group. I mean, yeah, just send it, yeah, email me. You're going to go person by person? Yes. Okay. Maxie can go first. She wants to go home. Okay. We're going to have an hour there. So we're ready to come back together as a group. And Maxie would like to go first. You can be direct in the net that. Yeah, yeah, I can. And then next try so each board member gets to share two stickies. Oh, but then we can put the rest of them. And then everybody's going to do a gallery of everyone's ideas. Do you ever feel like you're hurting cast players? No. Not with the board. Two period, not two per Two for Michelle, two for Scott. This is super complicated. How are you doing that? It's not as you guys. 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 I think it's because it's more important. See, this is why we don't start watching this. All right. Yeah. 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 All right, Maxine. 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 All right, All right, Maxine. 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 Um, in the introduction, I think, oh wait, I went way past it. It's 10 o'clock. Um, okay, it's 10 o'clock. So it says about, it's talking about, like, during the process, staff will develop recommendations for enrollment and program balancing, blah, 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 but also talk about how students are an integral part to the process, and then, that's what my statement says. And then in number five, about um, data formed or aligned yeah. with our values. What she said, um, focus on students and their inability to thrive when there is program enrollment imbalancing. Okay. It talks about schools, yeah. not students. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I should have added that. But okay. Those are my stickies. Should I go put them up now? Yes, please. Great. I will do that. And you, you can, can put, put up the other yeah, ones that you didn't share. Yes, yes, right. yes, yes. Oh, I'll wait for you to go. I'll put up all Okay. Uh, Okay, so on number one, um, we, I think it's important to just state, make the essential statement that enrollment imbalance, imbalances within schools and across schools lead to inequitable opportunities. Okay. And then um, number three, outcome goals, this is kind of the same theme, um, uh, but it's, yeah, it's really, our goals after we've reiterated the vision, which is just plainly, every student has equitable access to an exceptional education. Okay. 
Can I ask a question? I don't know if that's allowed or not. But inequitable enrollment, <laughs> inequitable enrollment doesn't have to lead to inequitable offering. Okay, so I'm going to stop us here shut me down. because it's going to be, um, you're leaving no, at 10, I'm, and I want everyone to have their two ideas. I'm reflecting on the current conditions. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not let saying me put that. It, let, me, let me put this in a parking lot somewhere. That it's something that I need to understand better in terms of, because that feels to me like a programmatic decision that we've made in the past, that I just need to understand the, the, the limitations of that. Okay. All right, so you guys are going to put up your stickies and you're yeah. going to listen to others as they speak. Who's ready to go next? I would go next. Oh, oh, you should go next. Andrew's going to go next with his top two. Um, so I just, I love the data-informed approach. I think that that will um, help with our overall, just the help with the objectivity and help with the credibility of the process, the more data-informed we are about it. And then engagement, when we talk about engagement, um, it needs to be a two-way street that sometimes engagement is listening to the community, but sometimes engagement is explaining to the community the rationale and reasons behind everything. Okay. Your partner, Rita? Director Moore? Um, so, under outcome goals, whatever number that is, um, uh, optimize use of facilities. Um, I, would, I would make a copy editing suggestion. Um, something so your like top idea is a copy editing suggestion? Yes, yes. Well, <laughs> we have that in some So use, use facilities and resources to optimize student level experiences. Okay. So I say that again? Use like facilities yeah. and resources to optimize the student experience. You're not maximizing the use of public assets just for the exercise of maximizing the use of public assets. Okay. Right. Oh. I mean, it makes it student-centered. Yes. Yep. Um, and he took the other stickies. Um, because <laughs> oh. my second one was basically what he said about the engagement stuff. So. Okay. Okay. All right. So go ahead and put your stickies up. And Michelle was next. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, under um, number one, the multi-year process in Southeast Portland starts with, with um, Kellogg. Um, <coughs> then other areas will follow. Which areas of town have unbalanced enrollment? Like, which would be the next phases? The okay. North Northeast would be the next phase. Okay. And then after that? Then there's very little on the west side. Okay. The smaller little bits. Little bits. Okay. So we're, we're doing, are we, second on that question, are we doing, are we using a, an equity lens then to, is that how the phasing came about? Well, there's some immediacy with Kellogg opening. Okay, because that's a new school. Okay, yes. Um, how will the phasing of the project impact what's happening in other areas of town? Is it going to be, uh, you know, you make an improvement in one area and it impacts neighboring areas? How do we anticipate that will that'll shake out? So you're asking us to respond to that right now, or is that a, it's a, a, it's a, it's a question? A, it's kind of an answer. unanswered question yeah, that, I mean, you, that you're looking for. Okay. Uh, looking but, at the entire system, when you do right. an improvement in one area, is that going to drive? So, so we are looking at what's bordering. In, you know, as we look at southeast, what's bordering, especially to the northeast, we're we're considering the schools that are there. Yes, and also and, like at are some we point at housing data. Housing, where affordable housing is going in, what the real estate trends are per neighborhood. That's all goes yeah. into the meat grinder of the demographic. That will go all part of the algorithm. <coughs> yep. Thank you. Okay. So go ahead and put up your stickies. And then Scott, your um, top two. So, basing this to me is a big that in question. What if there are ripple effects beyond the study area? Um, how, how access plays into all this? Because right. that will be outside the study area. Um, access is in um, Southeast. Yeah, I know, but uh, I'm guessing we, we have to consider, at least have to consider placements in other areas. 
invite you to put them up on the walls and we'll do a gallery walk after we hear from one more group. Two, okay. Two each. Um, I love the three goals, the middle school, the um, optimizing the facilities and the um, looking at co-location. I think I'd like us to have change the language so they're student focused goals. Um, but I think that really hits to the key priorities that we need to be looking at as we consider this work. So I really appreciate that focus and clarity. Um, and then my question, because we were just talking about strengths, and I found myself mostly just saying negative things instead of like, what are the things I actually like? So um, tried to add in some of that feedback. And then um, my question is, as we talk about community engagement particularly, how are we going to live in that tension of both the district-wide process around some of our values and the specific like community engagement in those smaller geographic areas? Because I think when we start talking enrollment and balancing, people from all over the district are going to like freak out a little bit. Uh, yeah, I'm getting nods from the public. Um, and so how do we allow space for both those voices and the, the local? So that was kind of my two most important of the 80. Okay. Apparently Julia and I have problems. So Ailey, I invite you to start um, putting your stick together. We're very thorough, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We had a robust discussion. We do have, we did have a robust discussion. Um, so I, the two that I had that I would focus on, were, one was in number three and one was in number five. And number three, what page was that on you? Uh, 30, no, 31. So it was on sort of the focus and like starting with Southeast. Because um, so my comment was Kellogg plus a second equitable middle school in phase one so that all Southeast students have actual access to quality programming. Um, sure, context is I think. Southeast people are going to say, we're always the guinea pigs, we got all the focus options, then we got the K-8s, now we're the first ones on the next round. So when we open Kellogg, the shiny new thing, everybody's going to want to go there, and then you're going to have this ring of schools around it that are like, hey, what about us? And then if we're off to some other area, um, to me it just makes sense to do it all at one time, because I can guarantee you, you're all of a sudden going to have all these kids at, middle, at Kellogg that we had no idea that they lived in Kellogg. Right, so let's let's do it holistically. So our, our intent in in this language was to support comprehensive middle school programming and not limit it to Kellogg, but we obviously need some help with the language. Yeah, I guess what my sharp point is when you look at that chart where the place where all the K-8s, under the K-8s are sure. south to predominantly southeast and you know, even places that have K-8s in other places, they're not necessarily under enrolled. It's a different set of issues. So I just think we should maybe just got the point. Um, this is a place where it doesn't make sense to phase. It should be a more holistic approach. Okay. Um, and then the second one was around the data. And this um, goes to um, you know, connect, connect disaggregated student achievement and SES data to enrollment patterns 
drive action on enrollment issues informed by student achievement data. Again, I think we can squeeze the balloon in some ways and like we're gonna make those kids go to that school, but I don't think we can that necessarily always works. Um, so it's a bigger issue of like how do we tell parents that this is gonna be a quality program where your students are gonna gonna be going to versus we can just make the boundary. So really connecting that data and trying to think how it informs people's thinking and how we might address the concerns people might have. Thank you. And then we invite you to um, put the rest of your stickies up. And now, um, so all the board members have shared their two. So what I'd like you to do is, um, Julia, can we help you get some of those up? Yeah, I did them. I put numbers on each of them. Great. So. So you can read the numbers. I, I did that as well. So let's, um, the rest of you, if you want to start a gallery, gallery walk, you do not need to all start at one. You can start anywhere. But we'll um, get Julia's up. Can I get some more volunteers to help get Julia's up? Thank you. These are ones. These are fives. Thank you. 
Well, and it also engaged needs to be spectrum. clear who the community is that we're engaging with. And, you know, how, how big is the challenge that we're biting off at any given time? And I think we're, we're on the road to articulating that in a way that people can understand. Um, I was just going to say that um, this is like the second or third time in a different process that uh, I, I feel like our, our vision has shown up organically. Like it doesn't feel contrived, contrived to tie a specific process back to um, our vision and the goals we identified in our vision. So that feels, not only feels good, but it feels very helpful. Um, like it gives us a leg up on this process in particular. Yeah, nothing makes me happier than seeing the whiteboard that didn't get erased from some meeting of who knows what. And it's vision, graduate portrait. Yeah. yeah. So I just, I've said all I can say tonight. It's been a long day. It's still home. Hey, what do you say? Julia still? Um, I like that all in around the room. Um, people commented on the fact that students were at the center appeared to be at the center. Mm -hmm. um, the I thought a really good question that I asked that I hadn't thought of that I mean, will have big implications is um, well, first of all, I was glad, really glad that there's a lot of focus on middle middle grades. You know, that's what it means. <laughs> <laughs> that to taking care of. Um, but the question yeah. about how high schools are part of this because I look at we're about ready to make probably six hundred million dollars in about eight hundred million dollars in investments in Madison, Benson, and Jefferson, and none of them have seventeen hundred students or are on their way to seven hundred students. So that seems like a big enrollment balancing um, piece. Or so I don't know how I don't know how it connects into the work. But I thought whoever put that up there is a, it's a great question. Thank you. <coughs> A great question of how that fits in, and you know, is it going to trump some of the other work, or does it need to be going concurrently um, so we don't build the schools and like where are the students? Um, but that, that's where we're heading right now. So great question. And then just a, an observation is that it seems like the word phasing. Um, People, there was just a whole bunch of different comments about it. Like, it's good. I'm not sure I like it. What does it mean? And so, I think maybe that's a call for like greater clarity about what it what it means and how it travels with these other pieces. Um, but I, I, the, I guess my last comment is I like that there seem to be um, a fair amount of consensus on. The comments are written in different ways, but they seem to be, you could look at clumps of comments and, um, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, in different areas. So it seemed like, okay, we're kind of directionally going the same place versus all the other things. Well, I really, a question about how our input will be used. So the first thing we will do is type, type it up, and uh, we have a, um, a team that will come together and um, we meet kind of several times a month um, and we'll incorporate this into the scope of work and then share that back with you. And certainly the two of you are our two board reps in that process, so we'll involve the two of you in that work. Excellent. <coughs> Can I ask a financial question? Sure. Um, are we invested in 3M for the statement? Should be. for now. The Kroger ones aren't as good. So I just want to thank you all. Thank you all for participating fully tonight. I appreciate your input and feedback in the process. Thank you. Guys. Have a good night. And also for all the data. What time do you have to be back tomorrow? Not talking about it. <laughs>